Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the January Impossible Medals webinar, and I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Justin Manley. So Justin has a huge amount of subsea and, and underwater experience, and he's going to talk about subsea 101, but he'll start with a, a brief kind of introduction. So over to you, Justin, and thanks for joining. Thanks. Yeah, happy to be here. Um, a pleasure to to share a, a, a shallow dive into a deep subject, or however you want to cover it. Um, very briefly, and I don't I don't want to belabor the point. Um, I've been working in this field. I built my first ocean robot uh, now thirty years ago, as of last year, um, which is becomes a little frightening uh, as one wakes up and looks in the mirror. But uh, but it's been an exciting ride. Um, very briefly, I've sort of spent. Uh, my career spread across academia, doing R&D in research labs, uh, followed by government public sector work. So academia was MIT, government was driven by my time with NOAA, where I primarily supported the ocean exploration program. Uh, and then in industry, uh, I was one of the first customer facing folks at Liquid Robotics, one of the first early venture backed ocean tech startups. So I was sort of there at the beginning. I took some time off to help Teledyne run a large ocean robotics group. Uh, and then I went back to Liquid to help them get sold. Um, that was uh, sort of through 2015-ish, 2016. These days I'm an independent uh, advisor. I work with a lot of different clients and technologies and projects. But uh, you know that's sort of the quick background. But we're here uh, to talk about um, subsea tech and a quick disclaimer. As I just alluded to, this is the, the slides you see here are sort of the accumulation of many years of work, and uh, I've tried very hard to make sure that clients and colleagues whose pictures are here are credited. Um, I take all all credit for failures and apologize in advance. Quick comment as well: if I'm referencing certain providers of equipment, this is sort of representative, not meant to be a "Hey, they're the right one to use." Always do your own due diligence if you're shopping for for technologies. And I think the most important disclaimer for you all is uh, this is a tremendously large and diverse industry, and, and this really is a 101 and an intro. Um, so probably any one of the conversations we're going to have here could turn into a whole other webinar. So with that, I'm going to dive in. Uh, I'm a big fan of sort of three-part uh, presentations or discussions. So uh, first, we're going to talk about some of the challenges uh, that the ocean environment presents. Uh, then we're going to talk about sort of some of the current ocean technologies out there that are being employed to get various jobs done. And a wind down with a little bit of highlights of some of the most interesting uh, innovations I'm seeing uh, in the space in some projects that I'm working on day to day. So with no further ado, why? what's the problem? What, what's up with working in the ocean? Well, we'll start with pressure, right? And I like this graphic, right, which gives you this real sense of we talk about the water column, and this looks like a column. And what's going on here, of course, is the pressure builds up as you go deeper. And you know, we've heard a lot about Titanic last year, so 4,000 meters, roughly depth of Titanic, nice reference number we'll talk about. Uh, and if you go into places like ChatGPT and ask it, what does 400 atmospheres feel like? Uh, after all the disclaimers about you should not do this, it's not safe. Um, you see quotes like, it's like standing under a nuclear bomb or 35 elephants on your head. Um, that's great. A little more precise, did some math. It's about one and a half times the pressure of a great white shark's bite. Or if you've got an average sized big toe, it's like 367 16 pound bowling balls, right? Point is, lots of pressure. This presents all kinds of challenges to technology. Fun fact about pressure, if you take a styrofoam cup down, to about titanic depth, it ends up shrunken, like you see in this photo. And that's because styrofoam cups are mostly air. And what happens is all that air gets squeezed out of that styrofoam cup. So the cup, the little cup and the big cup, they actually weigh the same if you put them on the scale. It's just been squeezed by the pressure of the ocean and it's now a more dense piece of foam. So pressure, this is probably the big one. Uh, it drives all kinds of uh, technological choices to make sure our equipment and devices can survive at pressure. Temperature is important. Um, it's perhaps more important as a challenge to the operating environment. As you can see here, what happens is very, very rapidly, as you go deep in the ocean, it gets pretty uniformly cold. 
and it stays uniformly cold. So, so long as you're not needing to be hot for some reason, and in fact, a lot of equipment uh, likes the exterior being cold because it helps with cooling of various things like processors, uh, you're generally okay. However, the thing you see here illustrated in sort of beige, the thermocline, this is a challenge. We're gonna talk some more about sound waves and how we communicate through the ocean. But the thermocline is a challenge because it basically blocks certain kinds of signals that we use often from getting through down into the deeper waters. Um, another comment is that batteries uh, are often, I, I say batteries are warm blooded. I'm from the Northeast. There's plenty of stories right now about Tesla owners getting half the range, right? The cold just saps the energy. So you need to be thoughtful about that. Another comment is that temperatures shape global currents. So in some cases, operating areas, the Gulf Stream is a classic example where there's a very powerful current. You have to plan for it. That's actually in many cases driven by temperature conditions. Fun fact about temperature though, is that at the bottom of the ocean, uh, there are hydrothermal vent systems where instead of being uniformly cold, they can be immensely hot. This is essentially a little crack in the surface of the earth where the superheated water and gases coming essentially from the earth's core can drift in and penetrate the ocean. So that's a pretty rare phenomenon. They do exist. Um, they're, they can be found all over the ocean, but they're usually uh, on, a, on a volume of seafloor basis. They're a small fraction of the area of the seafloor. Also, we need to talk about salinity. Uh, so this is a, it's about a four and a half ounce sea salt shaker, you know, that I went and did a did an image search for. And in every gallon of seawater, you have about four and a half ounces of salt. And I show that up there because if you think about it, if you think of that was your gallon jug at home and you filled it from the faucet and then you dumped all that salt in it, that gives you a real sense of, frankly, how salty ocean water really is. And of course, one of the big issues is that leads to rust, right, and corrosion. And it, by the way, it also doesn't work well with exposed electronics. Salty water can make things short out. So this is another huge thing we have to account for as we engineer systems. Fun fact here, so, and apologies for using silly units, right? But it, it kind of adds to the fun fact, right? If we add up the mass of seawater, we're about 1.4 sextillion kilograms, which leads us to 50 quintillion kilograms of salt in the ocean. Um, other fun stats I've seen is that if you dried all that salt out, it would cover the land mass of the earth with about three feet of salt. <laughs> so there's just a lot of salt in the ocean. Biofouling is another problem. This is less of a problem in deep ocean. Um, mostly this is what we'll call the photic zone where there's light that gets through because the light leads to organisms growing. As you see here, they encrust pretty much anything they can get their, uh, their hands on, so to speak. And this can really be a challenge, particularly for, if you think about things like offshore wind farms, oil, energy infrastructure, dams, uh, harbors, right? Biofouling can certainly uh, present a challenge to your technologies. It's again, less of an issue as we get deep in the ocean because those organisms are not so uh, available because uh, they need that sunlight. Fun fact here, barnacles uh, are the longest lived crustacean, right? So that's crabs and other kinds of shelled organisms. Barnacles can live for 20 years. Um, I didn't know that until I was prepping for this talk and I thought that was pretty interesting. Another issue of course is visibility. So on one hand, you know, as we, we could plot a different curve like we saw in temperature about how the light filters out and, you know, eventually it filters out by color, right? So we lose the reds uh, spectrums earlier down eventually to the blues greens. And eventually the ocean is sort of uniformly dark once we, once we reach, uh, frankly, not very deep water. Um, however, one of the things that comes up is you get this phenomena called marine snow. And so what you're looking at here is the, the glitter, the reflection of marine snow particles in the water which can actually make for really challenging imaging conditions. If you have your, if you think of this as a, as a camera with your lights right next to the camera, uh, you can often have a hard time seeing. So a lot of times we'll design equipment where the illumination is separated, uh, sometimes by some meaningful distance like meters from the imaging so that you don't get direct reflection. Fun fact here 
is what marine snow is, is actually uh, microorganisms, right? And this is just a photo uh, captured of all of the different kinds of organisms that you see in marine snow if you have your camera zoomed in close enough. Of course, uh, mapping. Mapping is an issue, right? You'd usually like to know where you're going. Uh, and so this, this is a little out of date, but it was a really nice graphic from the Seabed 2030 program, which is working to try to change what you see here. Their goal is to have the entire seafloor mapped by 2030. Um, as you can see from this color coding, there's a lot of work to be done. We really have not surveyed our own planet very, very well. Um, the classic slightly cliche fun fact is to say that we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the ocean. But the even more fun fact is that by 1967, NASA considered 99% of the moon's surface mapped. And that was explicitly to prepare for the Apollo landings. So it's a, it's a cliche, but it's also a, a, a validated fact. Additionally, as we as we go forward, and I and I love putting this graphic together because if you think about it, whether you're an Android or an Apple fan, uh, that smartphone in your hand or on your desk is a really key part of your life, and it just won't work underwater. Um, and likewise, Wi-Fi. the The situation here is that in salt water, radio frequency can propagate to about one wavelength which means your cell phone signal is maybe 35 centimeters and your Wi-Fi signal is perhaps as little as six centimeters. So you can't count on the things we take for granted. Fun fact here is that militaries do use radio, they, they call it um, extremely low frequency, to talk to their submarines at sea. But to do that, they have to build massive antennas. Uh, this report from CBS about one in China, they say that the antenna is the size of New York City, and, and they're serious. These antennas are kilometers long. Um, so, yes, you can sort of do that, but you, you can make the radio signal reach the, the, the contact, but you're talking very, very low bandwidth. We're not even, we're not even talking a 144-character message here. It's, it's even smaller. So, basically, abandon all your thoughts of using radio waves uh, underwater which of course leads to you also don't get to use GPS. And as we alluded to, uh, there's no maps. So no Google Maps, no Apple Maps. You're pretty much out of luck. We'll talk a little later about some of the solutions that are employed to solve this problem. Um, but the convenience we all have of GPS isn't there. Fun fact, if any of you are, are sailors, um, we've taken GPS for granted, but Loran, like this one you can see for sale on eBay, <laughs> Uh, as an artifact, but Loran, which was a predecessor to GPS, actually operated until 2010. Um, it, it took that long for the confidence in GPS or for the, the navigational authorities to take Loran offline. Energy. Okay, we're in the ocean, we have no oxygen, therefore we basically do not have internal combustion. Yes, you can resolve this with issues like taking stored air with you, there are systems for air independent propulsion typically used on military submarines, uh, besides nuclear. Nuclear, of course, is a, is a great option there. But basically, you have to approach your energy challenges underwater with, with different, uh, different methodologies and plan accordingly. Fun fact here, uh, and this has been an ongoing hope, the idea of seawater batteries has been held up as a, as a very powerful possibility. This is a prototype from a company that spun out of MIT called Open Water Power. They were trying to use seawater as a catalyst and essentially the battery would quote unquote burn seawater, not entirely true. But uh, this particular device was expected to deliver energy density about 10 times that of the best lithium batteries. Um, spoiler alert, that company got acquired, that technology never quite materialized on the market as expected um, since sort of still stuck in R&D. So while it's an exciting opportunity, it's not exactly uh, maturing as quickly as we might hope. Now pause for a second. We're going to start talking about technologies out there that, that account for all these problems and get work done. But I'm going to take a sip of coffee. So. Uh, one of my favorite things in this field is the acronyms, ASV, UUV, AUV, USV, ROV, right? And if you're not in this space day to day, you might be saying, help, alphabet soup. 
So hopefully by the time we get through this, you'll have a little better grasp of all of these acronyms. And, uh, and it's really, it's not about the terminology as much as it's about the technology. So we're gonna start with underwater vehicles, uncrewed undersea vehicles. Uh, and there are many of these, we're gonna go through this quickly. There are many ways to categorize. I, I like to use sort of generic categorizations and we start with small and small here is usually meant to be, as you see in the photo, I try to always provide a picture with a person so you can have a real sense of scale. So that vehicle on the bottom left is quite small. Um, the Remus vehicle up on the top and the ocean server vehicle on the bottom right, they're a little larger. They're sort of about twice the size of the orange one from Seabear, but these are all fairly compact. Usually they don't go very deep, 300-ish meters. They usually run for four, six, eight hours. Uh, and I say medium to high precision. What that means is they don't usually have the volume or the energy to carry some of the most powerful sensors. Um, they can carry some powerful sensors, but they'll typically drain their batteries faster. In this field, all of these underwater vehicles can be equipped with lots of different payloads these days. 15, 20 years ago, it wasn't the case, but there are many now. And in this category, these robots are built on the order of hundreds per year, uh, and they can cost as little as maybe fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, but depending on how you load them up with equipment, they can easily get to $500,000 or more. And it's a diverse market. There are lots of providers and those providers sort of evolve and change over time. As we get a little bit larger, um, and I'm just calling this medium, um, they're not as easy to deploy, but they're still fairly easy to deploy. Some of them like the Teledyne vehicle uh, are modular. So you can break them apart into pieces, put them in cases. And in some cases, people take them on airlines as checked luggage, uh, though the lithium batteries do present a challenge. Um, so here we're typically getting to depths of a thousand meters, uh, endurances get to more like 12 hours or longer. And that starts to matter because you can get more work done. You're, you're probably still using some kind of vessel to host these. And so a longer runtime gives you more productivity versus your price of vessels. Most of these are going to use high precision payloads. Uh, so for the best sensing data, the best positioning data. Again, you can get lots of different kinds of sensors on board. And these are produced, I say, tens per year. It, you know, that could be 50 in a good year. It could be 20 or 15 in a weak year. Um, and then, you know, the price point here, these start where the others end, you know, half a million dollars. They can easily get above a million dollars. Again, the sensors drive a huge part of the cost. And we'll talk more about sensors in a little bit. They start to get big. Um, one of the leaders in this large class is the Hugen vehicle from Kongsberg that's pictured in the bottom right. And again, you can see people there. These, for the most part, really do demand a host vessel, which shapes their economics and their utilization. Here, some of these vessels can operate for a few days. Um, they can get all the way 6,000 meters, we typically refer to as full ocean depth. Technically, some very small fraction of the ocean is deeper than that, but not much. And here, you know, 10 of these are usually built a year on give or take. These get pricey, you know, you're starting around a million dollars and you can easily break $5 million for one of these units, depending on how you want to approach it. Again, it's a competitive space. If you're shopping around, you can get bids from different providers. Then they get really big. Um, this, this is a sort of an emerging area. And honestly, it's mostly driven by defense. These are, these are robot submarines that will be operated from shore. As you can see in that top left picture there, uh, you pull them into a pier, you program them, you drive them out, they go do their thing. What you see in the top left is a vehicle that Boeing has produced called Orca in the defense sector. That's kind of the leading, leading indicator. Uh, its predecessor, Echo Voyager, is shown in the bottom left with that, that person just in there to give you a sense of how big that, that robot really is. Um, and then Kongsberg has a similar large vehicle coming to market. This is a very nascent market. Uh, it's not very commercial. It's very defense driven. The real reason you make these things so big is for the endurance. They can theoretically stay out for weeks or months at a time. 
Um, one of my personal concerns about this space is if you think about a, a large, or, well, small, whatever, you think about sending a robot out to sea and out of touch for, say, a week or two, um, or certainly a month, ask yourself how often you have to reboot your smartphone, right? which is probably your most reliable piece of electronics. Um, the challenge in making the code and the systems reliable so that you can have an autonomous system out of touch for a month are not on um, are not to be underappreciated, right? So hopefully they're all working it out. Moving on, there's a whole other type of undersea vehicle called the glider. This uses buoyancy control, basically gets heavier or lighter. Um, if any of you are scuba divers, you know how by taking air in or out of your lungs, you can sort of achieve neutral buoyancy or adjusting your buoyancy control device, right? Same idea. You change your, your mass, change your weight, change your uh, orientation as well of your center of gravity. And so what you've done here is you use a very small amount of energy for propulsion. You just use a little energy, get heavy, start to sink, and use the hydrodynamic effect of water moving over wings to control your motion. You get to a, a depth point, typically up to a thousand meters, little tiny bit of energy, make yourself light, and you float up. And so you're moving through the water in this seesaw pattern. These are lower precision. They're not gonna be doing high precision operations because their ability to control exactly where they are in the ocean is limited. Um, however, they can run for months at a time. They're very, very good at oceanographic sensing. Uh, and so the price point as well, you know, order of a quarter million dollars with a, with a high-end sensor suite. So they're also in pretty high volume. Something like a couple hundred of these are, are manufactured every year, usually for ocean science. Very exciting category of underwater robotics. This is the, the technology base and where we start to drift into with impossible metals. These are robots that are much better at controlling their position in the water. They're, you could sort of think of them as a, as a helicopter. They can move in any direction and hold position at any altitude or reference distance from a subject of interest. Not surprisingly, the dominant uh, market here is offshore energy. Uh, originally oil and gas, so Oceaneering, Saipem, these are long-term providers in that market. Saab has a, has a vehicle which was inspired by uh, mine hunting and is also now very active in commercial. Nauticus Robotics is another, uh, no longer a startup. They, they did have an IPO, but they're working on very sophisticated robots with a lot of autonomy. And that goes all the way up to intervention, like swimming up to a valve undersea and turning the knob. Right. So this is a compelling new area. It's it's not as commercially driven in the sense of you buy these things. They're typically service platforms. And so you're hiring a company to do a service rather than buying a robot to to do it yourself. The predecessors to these uh, are remotely operated vehicles. ROVs are still very, very important. Um, the key idea of an ROV is it has a tether. And the tether means that you have plenty of essentially unlimited energy and you have near perfect real-time control. So high definition video, very responsive. And so now you can have a human being behind the controls making rapid decisions to do very important work. Smaller ROVs like the video ray on the top left are very commonly used either for commercial inspection or they're a very popular tool for militaries to find and, and diffuse and neutralize mines. Larger ROVs, and you can sort of see on the top right, and that, that's a very big vehicle. It's sort of the size of an SUV. It requires a very large crane. It requires a very large ship. The costs get very high very quickly. But if you need to do something like build an underwater pipeline, uh, build an oil rig, you know, if you need to manipulate your environment very precisely, uh, you're going to want that capability. So this is uh, an area where the technology is quite mature, um, but it's still a vibrant marketplace given all the activity that goes on in the ocean. Very briefly, this isn't subsea, but it is, it is shaping the way we do work at sea, are uncrewed surface vehicles or vessels. And basically, these are boats. Uh, they could be, the, the one on the top left is about a meter long, kind of feels like a toy radio control boat. 
all the way down to on the bottom right, you know, that looks like a classic speedboat you might buy to go fishing. These are all, I call them conventional because they use conventional propulsion, whether that's electric motors with batteries or like the one on the bottom right, that's the same kind of outboard motor you'd, you'd buy on your boat, right? And they essentially take away the human operator. Some of them are mostly remote controlled. So usually the operator will be watching it and supervising it like the top left, that's for harbors and or rivers, or with the proper satellite telemetry, they can go well beyond line of sight. Endurance here varies, missions vary, but one of the key things is these tools are making survey. So uh, remember the mapping comment, right? These tools are making it easier for us to map the seafloor. They also can provide an important link to undersea robots using some technology we're gonna talk about in a minute. Another category here are unconventional, and I call it unconventional because these are usually taking novel approaches to energy, solar, wind, wave power, there's a huge variety of platforms in this space. They're, they're, they're quite exciting, the technology. They are, again, taking human presence remotely to very far places, Antarctica, middle of the ocean, and they're changing the economics because they can stay at sea for a long time. Um, so again, not so critical to subsea, but they're a key piece of the ecosystem and, and shaping tech. So I'm halfway through my technology story for you because there are more acronyms. There's all of these other acronyms and these are all essentially sensor technologies or payload systems. So again, I'm gonna fly through here so that someday, you know, if you catches your fancy, you can do more homework on any one of these. Side scan sonar is a really important technology. The idea here, as you sort of see in this image is a, the instrument, Often it was a towed body these days that could be an underwater vehicle. Sound waves are fired out from side to side. They bounce off features on the seafloor. They come back to the, to the sensor and the sensor creates an image. Key thing about side scan is classically, as you can see in the very middle there, you've got a gap, call it the nadar. Um, and what does that look like? Well, this is a typical side scan sonar output. Um, and you can see it, it if you look at these long enough, you become very adept at recognizing the features, but you can see that there is high resolution, right? And the other thing you see is this, this idea of shadow, right? So the, the larger the shadow, the larger the feature off the seafloor. Um, and also in this case, you can see the zoomed in of the portion on just the left, that's a diver, right? And what's interesting is the white blob is not real clear what the white blob is, but the black, which is the acoustic shadow, looks much more like a diver. Um, so it's, it's an interesting technology to get good at interpreting, but it is very good at covering large areas of seafloor relatively quickly so that you can understand what's going on. Typically very good at finding things like a shipwreck or a lost airplane or mines. So this is a, a very common tool, widely used. Another tool is called the sub-bottom profiler. The basic idea here is that certain frequencies of sound can move through the water and then move through the sea floor. They reverberate off of different strata in the geology and they come back. This can be very high resolution, but low penetration. So, you know, penetrate a few meters in the sea floor looking for say a cable or a pipeline or like this we're seeing here is much more large, uh, deep penetration where you're looking for things like uh, geological features. Classically uh, in the oil industry, you're looking for reservoirs and you're looking to understand the geology so that you can do oil exploration, oil drilling and oil production. Another powerful tool is called multi-beam echo sounders. Uh, here you're projecting sound wave in a different configuration this can be done from a ship. This can be done from underwater vehicles. The closer you are to the seafloor, you can use uh, higher frequencies. Those higher frequencies don't go as far, but they give you better resolution. So you'd use a low frequency on a ship and you'd be doing more like mapping the features of the seafloor, such as the bottom image. Whereas with an AUV, they can get closer to the seafloor with higher precision. You can create images like you see there of a shipwreck. So this tool is very common, is very commonly used on underwater vehicles and ROVs and ships, uh, and really is the, 
desired standard for seafloor mapping these days because you really are getting this three-dimensional rendering of your whatever you're looking at. A tool that is becoming much more common is called synthetic aperture sonar. The the concept is very similar to side scan sonar, but what we can do is now the you create what's called a synthetic aperture or, or you, you lengthen the array by collecting sound returns while moving the array through the water. This is derived from synthetic aperture radar, which is used on aircraft and satellites. And all you really need to know is it's a lot harder to do than side scan and we, what unlocked the power is greater processing and greater precision of positioning. And what we get is even more compelling imagery of the seafloor. And here you can see incredible resolution, ripples in the seafloor, plus a pipeline feature. And we can even get to the point where we're getting essentially three-dimensional, this, this is an image product combined of side scan data plus photo data, so this is, this is a rendered product from multiple sensors, but it is enabled by synthetic aperture sonar. So all of a sudden it's like, okay, the ocean is no longer um, an obstacle. We can pretty much see what's going on down there with these powerful tools. Of course, we like to actually see, so cameras are, are important. Cameras are cameras. The technology, there's lots of, we could get into details of how the technology works. Lasers are becoming more powerful. I'll show you a product in a second. But essentially that picture on the bottom right, that's actually from a project in 2004 that I was part of. And we had high definition imagery, right? Classic, Not, I mean, today's high def at Consumer Electronics Show is a little higher than what we had then, but essentially as good as seeing it with your own eyes. Mentioned lasers, lasers, LIDAR, if you've been tracking, you know, autonomous cars, or if you are aware you have a LIDAR probably in your phone, it's part of how your phone is helping do your image recognition and things like that. These are much more powerful lasers in the dark ocean and you get an image like you see on the top right that is a very clear image of an undersea oil infrastructure as built. And as you can sort of start to see in the larger image, you can now put these 3D renderings because it's not just optically precise, it is actually um, ge geometrically precise. So you could put a ruler on that or you can go on digitally and you can measure things. So now the, we call this metrology in the oil industry. You really understand where everything is relative to each other so that you have a, a very clear understanding of your, your infrastructure on the seafloor. You can do this for all kinds of other applications as well. So drifting into positioning, um, I mentioned we use sound waves. So uh, the technologies or the techniques, the signal processing typically emulates what we might do with radio. So, you know, radar, you send sound out, it bounces off something and it comes back. You know, acoustics, the multi-beam I mentioned, same deal. Long baseline here is sort of a transpondery approach where you have an acoustic instrument and you know its position and another device interrogates it. So it sends out a call and says, hey, base station, where are you? Base station says, hey, here I am. You measure the distance between those, you encode the position of the base station and the signal and you can calculate your position quite well. Um, you, this technology, depending on frequencies uh, and how you install it, you can get below one meter uh, precision of locating your device. The challenge is you have to put those transponders in place. And if they're on the seafloor, like in the bottom of this picture, you have to survey them in, in advance, and then you have to program the network. So it adds time and expense. Way to mitigate that is what they call ultra short baseline. So without getting into the complexities of phase differencing and uh, et cetera, essentially same thing happens except that you only have one unit, in this case attached to say the ship, that unit can measure the range and bearing to an undersea device and the undersea device can get similar updates. The weakness here is, be, is essentially not quite as precise or not quite as large a coverage area for your operations. Another way to find your way, if you've ever back long, long ago, you know, someone would give you directions and say, after the stoplight, go three tenths of a mile and turn right into my driveway. And you did that with your odometer on your car. If you ever remember doing that, um, 
Inertial navigation systems are conceptually similar. They help you track your motion from the last time you measured your position. So let's say you got a GPS hit, you can use an inertial system and you know you've gone uh, you know, north for two miles and then east for a mile and you think you're where you think you are. There are so many different acronyms and underlying technologies here. Basically what it comes down to is drift. So you, if you do that two miles up and one mile over, how far off you are is a measure of drift, typically calculated in distance traveled. And the, the point here is essentially the more money you spend, the, the better your precision. Um, so again, this in and of itself, this is a whole industry and field and lots of complexity, but it's important for undersea vehicles. Another uh, thing here, and this is actually the better, uh, this is more apt to when I talk about the idea of driving, watching your odometer. A Doppler velocity log is a tool that measures the motion relative to you, if you're a moving vehicle, of either the sea water or the sea floor. The sea floor is better because it's not moving. If you're measuring your position relative to sea water and you happen to be in a current, that's less useful. But this is kind of like the odometer in your car. It shows you how far you've gone. It's telling you how fast you're going. And essentially almost any underwater vehicle doing any kind of meaningful work will carry one of these devices to help it get a better position relative to typically the seafloor. We talked about telemetry. Uh, I mentioned how we use sound waves. Sound waves are the most common way to move data through the water. Gives you the longest range by the way when i say long range we're typically talking single digit kilometers maybe 10 maybe at a stretch 15 kilometers um but but so that's considered long range that's nothing compared to you know radio signals for example but you're typically getting a low data rate you know these days uh commonly you could you can move a text message over some kilometers often this is what we call half duplex so you send one signal and then you send a signal back. You're not getting immediate two-way connectivity. There are evolutions of acoustics. There are demonstrators which have moved, you know, full video over a few kilometers. Again, that's half duplex. They send the video one way, not the other way. Um, so we're getting there, but the physics are the physics and acoustics are always gonna be limited to that, you know, kilometers of distance. Optical telemetry works. Um, either with blinky LED lights or lasers. You can get much higher data rates, but you get shorter range. Um, and so it's, it's typically used in very specialized applications. There are some RF and magnetic. And so just to be clear, so the RF is typically sort of Wi-Fi. We talked about how it doesn't go far, but it does go. And so you could envision coming up short range to use high bandwidth to say offload a lot of data without a physical connection. There's also uh, an effort, uh, this company called C-Signum is using magnetic, essentially high frequency shifting of magnetic signature can also send data. And that one's interesting because it can send the data from the water through the water surface and into the air. It's the one technique that will uh, will propagate. So what I should be saying here, I'm sorry, is, is it's both EM, electromagnetic and RF are rare, but they do exist. I would just wanna briefly mention, because again, um, there's acronyms galore in this field, science payloads. All of these are devices that measure something. Um, conductivity, temperature, depth is the classic. So how salty is the water? It varies. That's important to oceanographers. What's the temperature? That varies. Both of those are very important to the physics of sound. We call it the sonar equation. So you want to collect that information to help calibrate how your how your sonar and or telemetry systems work. Hydrophones, it's just an underwater microphone. You can listen for things, magnetometers, you can detect, detect metallic objects. All of these are different ways of sensing the ocean and understanding its physics, its biology, its chemistry. Okay. Um, and I definitely wanted to make sure I left some time to answer some questions. So we're, we're winding down. Just want to talk a little bit about innovation that I'm seeing in the space. And one example here, this is a conservation project in the Caribbean. And the objective is to, to 
not just count grouper. So you may have seen videos um, on the internet where you sort of, hey, look, there's a fish, there's a fish, there's a fish, there's a fish, right? One fish, two fish, three fish groupers, right? Um, that's pretty cool. And it's a pretty capable technology if you're in an environment like this on a coral reef where the fish are visible. What my colleagues in this project are doing beyond this is actually running facial recognition concepts on individual fish. Right, so we're getting to the point where we have the image resolution and the processing power to track individual fish. In this case, they, they've named one fish Curious George. And they've seen Curious George, if you look at this, over years. Grouper are, are fairly long-lived fish. Um, and this fish they've been tracking, this individual fish they've been tracking for years. This is a really powerful tool for science because now it's it's moving to really serious ecosystem resolution you know does this fish does he swim if he's i assume it's a he because they called him george uh does he swim around to a lot of different reefs or just stay in one reef right does he favor two reefs how far apart are they you know what what is the what are the conditions there these are questions now they can start to answer instead of in an aggregate species level they can get down to individuals so Powerful tech, uh, very important that we're, we're getting this done in the underwater environment. Likewise, uh, a very similar example, but marine mammal monitoring is a big deal, right? And here, we're, this is a surface use case. So the surface boat, you know, you can sort of see how different technologies provide different resolutions. So the basic optical camera, bottom left, all right, yeah, maybe those are sea lions, but then you turn on the thermal camera and you're like, oh yeah, those are definitely sea lions. And now you can start to do things like count how many of them are there. So you can start to make management decisions. You can do the same thing underwater with acoustics. I don't have any slides on that because frankly, it's not very interesting to look at. Um, and even if I played the sounds for you, it would just sound like clicks and snaps and cracks, right? So, but we can use the same techniques, acoustic processing, AI, machine learning algorithms, and we can really start to understand our ocean environment at a, at a much higher resolution. One more emerging technology I really wanna mention is called eDNA, environmental DNA. The premise here is that organisms shed their DNA into the environment. By the way, this, this works on land too, right? It's not just an ocean thing. But so let's say you're looking for great white sharks. Great white sharks shed their DNA. That DNA lingers in the water column for up to a week, typically three to five days. So they've built devices. This device on the bottom right was built at Mbari. It is an underwater DNA processing lab. Goes into this pressure chamber and essentially a water sample comes in and you have to know what you're looking for. Um, but if you know what you're looking for and you've programmed the device to detect those signatures, you can say, hey, yep, yeah, there was a great white shark here in the past few days. Um, this is really powerful because it's not just great white sharks, it's any organism that you've sequenced the DNA of. So you can start to do meaningful, ongoing understanding of the environment. This technology has moved from that big can, which was basically put underwater and left on the seafloor, and they've made a smaller version that goes in that robot on the top left. Uh, Mbari calls that the long range AUV. They've recently commercially licensed it to Saab. So the idea of robots that can go for a thousand miles, stay out at sea for a long time and come back and tell us what biological features they saw over that distance, really gonna change our abilities to manage uh, our ecosystem. So uh, last trend I wanna comment on. So the last comments, earlier comments there was how innovation and sensing and processing is very rapidly changing our ability to do important things, both for conservation and for commercial operations. The other big trend is the price for performance ratio in ocean tech is changing. The Seabear underwater vehicle top left, fully outfitted with useful sensors is about 75 grand. The ROV on the bottom right, you know, it, it can't do everything, but it can do a lot, order of $10,000. That USV on the top right, their sell price is not quite under $100,000 yet, but another year of manufacturing, and I bet that boat will be under $100,000. Why does that matter, right? So we use the case of the USV. That USV, if it can stay out at sea, let's just say six months out of 12, 
right? It's solar powered. Yes, it doesn't work everywhere, but but where it works, it stays out to sea for say six months of the year. It has a service life of three to five years. It costs you $100,000. By the end of three to five years, you will have spent more on the personnel time to oversee it and the satellite data telemetry to get your data home than you will have spent on the boat itself. So the CapEx is going towards zero. So OpEx, capital expenditure going towards zero, operational expenditure dominates your equations. And that's really gonna change the way we make economic decisions in the ocean. So these trends are real. Um, it, it goes across the sector and I, I call it approaching free. That's not technically accurate if you're an accountant, but on an amortization basis, the line goes towards zero. So those are some trends that I think are really important in the space. Um, a last comment, uh, just because I like to, I like this quote, the Economist some years ago claimed that the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data. Ocean robotics uh, is, is going to drive a much different approach, a data-driven approach to understanding the ocean. Um, that's going to open up new economic opportunities. It's going to improve environmental management. Uh, and it's going to make all the activities that are not data, so anything we've got to touch, build, move around underwater or on the water, that's all going to get easier too because we're going to have better data. So I will pause here for a moment. This, by the way, is the Gulf Coast, a beautiful sunset over the Gulf of Mexico. There's my contact information. I am very happy to make myself available after the fact for conversation and discussion. And I think what I'm going to do now is stop sharing and uh, answer quick questions if that's uh, if that's cool with you, Oliver. Yeah, that, that was amazing. That was really, really great. I uh, really appreciate you doing that. Uh, I think, Holly, you're going to manage the questions. So over yes, I am. So please, um, there's a raise your hand button down and along the bottom controls. Raise your hand and I will call on you. Uh, Mike. Yeah, that, that was like un unbelievable. Um, probably, I mean, I feel like I know enough about this industry, but after listening to you, I know how much I don't know. Um, so, so a quick question, like, do, do you, do you see like, and I, I never even thought to ask this question before, but do you see the path towards sort of a monetization of this industry? Um, it's something I never would have dreamed to even ask, but is that in, is that a line of sight thing or are we still pretty far off? By, I assume you mean specifically sort of a data economy monetization. Well, oh, I'm sorry. What I mean, so I'm 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 a roboticist, you know, at BC. So my my curiosity stems around like, is are we going to see more opportunities for companies that enter this market, um, and you know, more relevant technology? Because it seems like the technology is just becoming so much more um, realistic and less yeah. of a hurdle for people to people to adopt and embrace, create, build, and, and whatnot. I hope, yeah. I, I hope I asked the question in the way that made sense. Yeah, the short answer, so that's kind of where I was alluding to towards the end there, right? So yeah, that's, that's, as, that's, what, that's what prompted my question, exactly. Yeah. So in a nutshell, as the cost of hardware and the barriers to entry to make hardware go down, more and more competitors are going to get in that space, which is going to make it more competitive, which is going to make the price performance better for all users. And then as data technologies, our ability to process and make decisions and be thoughtful get better, it is definitely going to drive economic utilization in the ocean for all purposes. So, so there's a lot of public sector interest, there's a lot of defense interest, there's a lot of commercial interest. All of those different sectors are gonna benefit from essentially this, this better optimization of, of higher tech in the ocean. Um, what that means in terms of company creation and startups, et cetera, um, it, it's hard to say because the ocean market, while the tech is moving fast, the ocean markets are still not as fast as, say, software as a service. And so the investment community and the entrepreneurial community are still trying to figure out, like, how do you drive growth in this industry faster even though the customers may not buy as fast as say venture capitalists want them to. That, I mean, there's a, we could have a whole nother conversation about that, but yes, oh, sure, it's I'm an sure, exciting yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. That was perfect, cheers, brilliant. Thank you so much. Right on. Rahul, if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question. Oh, you're on mute. 
There you yep. go. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK. Uh, yeah. Uh, firstly, a very well-structured uh, presentation and a very good revision for going through whatever we have known for so many years, but very well done. Uh, my question is now, my curiosity is, how would you relate these technologies to what Impossible Metals is trying to do as far as the mining of uh, the seafloor is concerned? Yeah, it's a great question. And I sort of, I, I deliberately uh, avoided going into that in detail here, but I'll, I'll tell you a couple of examples. So mentioned the glider vehicles, right? So the glider vehicles have given us a deep expertise base in buoyancy control, which is important to Impossible Metals. Um, I mentioned briefly some of the many robotic systems involved in intervention, right, in the energy industry. Those are vehicles that are teaching us about precision control and manipulation, right? Another key thing we're looking at. And then towards the end there, I was sharing with you various innovations in AI and machine learning and biological monitoring, right, which are going to shape the field, not just for how impossible metals technologies will do their job, right, in, in harvesting uh, minerals, but also in how our uh, surrounding social license structure of environmental monitoring and government agencies will inform themselves. And so all of the trend lines are saying that the technology that impossible metals is, is evolving is benefiting from all the things I've just talked about. Meanwhile, the regulatory and economic environment around it is going to become better informed and better able to make science-based good decisions. So the operating environment uh, should be well, well thought through, right? So those, yeah, that's essentially everything I've talked, almost everything I've talked about is going into the innovations and, and the approaches that Impossible is, is, is pioneering. All right. Thank you, Matt. You're up next. Did we lose him? Sorry, your connection's not oh. great. Um, <laughs> thank you for the presentation. I was super thorough. I really enjoyed uh, learning about all the other technologies that I don't know about. But um, just curious from, from your perspective, um, in terms of commercial operations and the, some of the, the drivers in that, in that sector, what technologies do you see as sort of critical to you know establishing viable scalable operations um and what what sort of innovations uh in the coming the coming years do you anticipate yeah i mean the classic we we've always talked about sort of energy telemetry you know energy and connectivity and bandwidth and you know autonomy gets thrown around a lot what does autonomous mean you know, the, the trends here are, I would say there's there's really two. There is change in physical technologies. Energy density of batteries gets better. Material science lets us make something lighter and stronger. Um, you know, the, so the, the physical evolution of hardware, usually driven by other industries, whether that's defense or our smartphones or whatever, right? Those changes we can adopt. And then the other challenge is how we adopt more powerful software tools, right? And so that comes down to, you know, in this space, uh, autonomous robots doing survey and study. Yeah, great. We're pretty much there. Autonomous robots physically impacting the environment. Uh, we've got some more work and development to do. But for example, uh, I showed Nauticus Robotics. So Nauticus Robotics is basically telling their clients that instead of a human being making the decision and, and driving the controls to turn a valve on an oil field, they're building the robot. And so you can tell the robot, go turn valve two from open to closed. And they're suggesting that we're at the point where that can be done. And the most important people to convince are the company executives, accountants, and lawyers, right? Like, because it's the liability problem, not the, like the engineers are gonna sign on first <laughs> and the risk managers are gonna sign on last. And so all the trends are going in the right direction to improve productivity, better economic opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. But we always gotta remember the human factor. So hardware, software, human beings, evolving as a team, 
will will get us to new economic opportunities. Thank you. All right, uh, Justin, we have a question in the chat from Kiran. He says, thank you for providing us with a comprehensive view of ocean technologies. I wondered as to which of the positioning and, and telemetry technologies will be suitable to the mission of impossible, impossible metals and who might be the lead vendors for that? Yeah, so my view is that the impossible metals problem is not too bad from positioning because essentially you're going to send a robot down to the seafloor It'll hit, if we use say USDL system, which is probably the most convenient, it's gonna hit the seafloor and it's gonna know where it is relative to the earth within a few meters, say five. Um, and then it's gonna turn on high precision relative positioning. So an inertial system and a Doppler. Um, yeah, right. And so now it's gonna know where it is relative to the seafloor within centimeters. And then it's gonna use its cameras to harvest. So you know, which USBL vendor gets picked, you know, for, for experimentation purposes, the USBL and DVL vendors are the ones that are the best. Once you go commercial, the vendors you pick are the ones that, that negotiate a volume pricing deal the best, because this is not what we need to do with these robots is well within the realm of current conventional solutions. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just, I don't, I'm gonna use the word straightforward and Jason and the engineering team are gonna yell at me and say, man, it's really hard, it's not straightforward, but we understand the physics and we have the technology. Yeah, and, and, and I'll just add, you know, we're not announcing the vendors that we have selected at, at this time. And as Justin mentioned, what we use in Eureka 2 may not be what we ultimately use in, in production, but, the alphabet soup of of acronyms. You can see we have USBL on. This is this is a schematic of Eureka two, and you can see the USBL at the top. You can see the INS and the DBL. Uh, we have something like thirteen cameras. Um, just to go back, you know, there's there's a lot of technology that we have integrated that Justin has been describing um, in this vehicle, and you know. As as people know, it, it has quite a lot of capabilities uh, with the capability to go to 6,000 meters, uh, quite a long endurance, et cetera. And, and, you know, so I don't really want to make it about, about Eureka 2, but I just wanted to kind of close the loop and all of the technologies that Justin's been describing, you know, we are integrating and the areas uh, in blue, basically the buoyancy engine, the robotic arm and the AI algorithms, those are the unique IPs that we invented because we didn't find anything on, on the shelf. But all the rest are standard subsidy components that we integrate to the vehicle electrically, mechanically, and we have to write software for. Thank Holly, you. Any, any more questions? Yeah. Thank you, both yeah. Justin and Oliver. Yeah. You're so welcome. I, do we have time for one more? Our Austin has raised his yep. hand. Great. Happy to do a quick one. You're on mute. Still on mute. Hmm. Still on mute. You're still on mute. Uh, it's it's the round button in the bottom of the window. Oh shoot! Unfortunately, uh -oh. no. you're you're welcome to shoot me an email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I can't unmute you. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. come on, on me. Yeah, sorry, I'll just real quick. People can reach yeah. out. I'm finally on LinkedIn. I'm I'm very happy to network and communicate and follow up on all of this. Great. All right, I think we're good. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and close the call. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Justin. Have a great weekend. Yeah. Thank Cheers. Bye-bye. Stop recording. There we go.